السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam All his companions May Allah bless his entire household And may Allah bless every single one of us And grant us all goodness and ease My brothers and sisters Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiyallahu an This man has an amazing story His name was Khabbab ibn al-Arat When he was a young boy He had come from Najd In the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula and what happened is there was a war that took place in Najd when he was a young boy and the enemy was victorious so what they did is they enslaved the little boys and girls and whoever there was and they sold them in the markets as slaves so one of those who was sold in the market in Quraysh was this young boy known as Khabbab ibn al-Arat and a woman known as Ummu Anmar al khuzaiya bought him. And what she did, she found that he was a very intelligent boy, but now he was enslaved. So she decided to send him to the top blacksmiths in Quraysh to learn how to make swords. And he became a person at a very young age. He knew how to make swords such that he was the best in the whole of Quraysh. Or should I say the best in the area, although he was not from Quraysh. So the top leaders of Quraysh used to come to this young man in order to make their swords because he made the best. So even the leaders knew who Khabbab was and they knew that this man Ibn al-Arat, he is a slave of Ummu Anmar. So one day as he was making one of his swords and some of the top brass of Mecca were standing near him, he was so happy and he was excited and he was saying to himself you know what what he is saying is the truth so they looked at him and they said what are you talking about who is saying the truth he says haven't you heard about what's going on here so they said what are you on about what is it who are you talking about now khabbab ibn al-arat prior to this he always used to sit on his own he did not have many friends and because he was from afar he used to think what Quraysh is doing is actually unacceptable. They are enslaving their little girls. They are burying them alive. Uh, sorry, they are burying their girls alive. And at the same time, they are fighting with each other over small things. They are worshipping idols and whatnot. All this is wrong. So now that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had come out with the deen, Khabbab ibn al-Arat was so excited and he said, I always used to say to myself, one day all this nonsense has to come to an end. So he was so happy. So these people asked him, what are you talking about? He said, haven't you heard about Muhammad? May peace be upon him. He is the messenger of Allah and he's calling towards the truth. So these, they began or they became very angry and they began to tell the others, look at what this Khabbab is saying until the brother of Ummu Anmar, whose name was Siba ibn Abdul Uzza, what he did is he came along and he asked Khabbab ibn al-Arat the question again. Who are you talking about? He said, look, I haven't said anything bad. I have not reneged from the religion of your fathers, forefathers because I never belonged to it. And I'm just following a man who's calling us to worship the maker alone and to leave the idols and to be good and kind as best as we can. What is wrong with it? They beat him up thoroughly because he was a slave. And Quraysh knew that this man is going to be persecuted because he's got no relatives. We own him. So we will deal with him. How dare he accept Islam? And it is reported he was the sixth person to declare his shahada. Number six. So what happened is they started persecuting him in the same way that they used to persecute Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, who was also enslaved, but he was from Habasha from Africa. And uh, Khabbab ibn al-Arat was dragged in the hot desert rocks and sand such that the meat from his body began to come out and the bone was showing on his back. His ribs were showing and so on. And he says, I had none besides Allah. He said it was burning so much that the coldest or, or what was extinguishing the fire was actually my sweat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Only because he said there is none worthy of worship besides my maker. And they kept on persecuting him and they kept on telling him, Oh Khabbab, as soon as you say, 
I reject what Muhammad has brought, we will stop. He did not say that. He did not say it. He said, it's fine. You can do what you want. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day passed him whilst this was happening. And exactly what was happening was Ummu Anmar had taken hot iron rods and heated them up in the fire and she was burning his head with them. And he could do nothing about it. And he was fainting. You know, he was literally unconscious. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa made a dua, Oh Allah, help Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiyallahu an. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat made a dua as well to say, Oh Allah, protect me from Ummu Anmar. And a few days later, Ummu Anmar became so sick that she started suffering headaches. Those headaches had no cure. And she was a wealthy woman from Quraysh. And at the same time, when she tried to go and achieve or receive medication to cure herself, they told her the only way your headache will stop is if you take a hot rod and heat it in the fire and, and you burn your head with it. So they had to do it for her exactly how she did with Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And she was screaming and wailing like an animal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Remember my brothers and sisters, when we harm others, that will come back to haunt us one day. So just be careful. Let your tongue be secure. Don't let it harm others. Let your, your, the parts of your body be secure. Don't let them harm others. It will definitely come back to haunt you. It definitely does. No matter who it is on the globe, and no matter what type of persecution they engage in against innocent people, they will pay for it at some stage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So at a certain time, subhanallah, Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an, he was relieved of all this difficulty to a certain extent because people saw what was happening. He was the one who used to listen to every verse of revelation. Last night we spoke about how they used to tiptoe at night in order to go away to learn more of the Quran. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu was one of them. And he was the one whom when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu entered the house of his brother-in-law Saeed ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu and saw his sister Fatima bint al-Khattab also known as Ummu Jamil radiallahu anha and he beat them up. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu was in the house teaching them Quran and he had hidden away because Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu would have beaten him up. And when he heard Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu saying, take me to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came out from his hiding place and he declared the takbir, Allahu Akbar. He says, oh Umar, I heard yesterday Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al-Umarain. Oh Allah, grant strength to Islam by one of the two Umars, either Amr ibn Husham, who was Abu Jahl, or Umar ibn al-Khattab. Khabbab ibn al-Arad says, I heard that dua yesterday, and that is why I know Allah will open your heart to Islam. Let's go to the bait of, to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam. And they went to Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam. This was Khabbab ibn al-Arad. He was the one who used to teach them the Quran because he used to listen to every single verse so much so that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says that when I had questions about the Quran I used to go to Khabbab ibn al-Arat to ask him exactly how to recite and exactly what was meant and so on subhanallah so this Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu was such a powerful man we said that he used to make swords one day Al-As ibn Wa'il who was one of the tyrants of Quraysh had taken something from him and owed him money and refused to give him money because he was a Muslim. And Al-As ibn Wa'il told him, Hey, you are the one who says there is heaven, isn't it? So Khabbab ibn al-Arad says, Yes, there is heaven, there is hell, and there is a life after death. So I owe you money. I'm not going to pay it to you unless you disbelieve. Or when we are resurrected and I get my heaven, then I will pay you whatever you want. So Khabbab ibn al-Arad was a very poor person. He needed the wealth and he says, how can you say this? Meanwhile, verses were revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أَفَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ بِآيَاتِنَا وَقَالَ لَأُوتَيَنَّ مَا لَوْ وَوَلَدَا أَطَّلَعَ الْغَيْبَ أَمِ اتَّخَذَ عِنْدَ الرَّحْمَنِ عَهْدَا كَلَّا سَنَكْتُبُ مَا يَقُولُ وَنَمُدُّ لَهُ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ مَدَّا Allah says, do you see the one who disbelieves in our signs? And he is saying that when he dies, he will start getting wealth and children, and then he will make the payment back. Referring to Al-As ibn Wa'il with his story, 
with Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an. Allah says, nay, we will write down what he is saying and we will punish him severely. Now I want to tell you, if the Quran has made mention of a particular person's punishment, it means that person will not accept Islam. It's over. Like Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watabba. Once Abu Lahab was cursed in the Quran, everyone knew this man is never going to accept Islam because the Quran, it's there forever. And once Al As ibn Wa'il was cursed here and Allah said he will be punished, it's over. You do not need to expect that this man is going to turn to the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from amongst those whose hearts are hardened and may he never punish us. So this was the man. He used to listen carefully to the verses of the Quran. At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma, he was given such a high monthly salary because he was known as as sabiquna ila al-Islam, one of the first few to accept Islam. So he had a surplus of wealth. So much so that when he was living in Kufa, Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, he decided to build a very small house. And he had a special place that he built where he would keep his money. And all the poor people knew that if you want any money, you can go without permission into the house of Khabbab ibn al-Arat, into the specific room, into that corner and take what you want. He has said, everyone can take from here if they need and they do not need my permission. That was Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu. Imagine. Recently, I was reading of how some people in the Middle East have now understood that there is a lot of wastage of food. And what they've done is they have big freezers outside their houses where they put the remainder of their food and anyone is free to come and take from that food. And mashallah, it's working and it's working wonders. Inshallah, I hope it can be implemented in more places where the leftover food we have is not wasted. My brothers and sisters, we've always been pointing at the Middle East because we notice what goes on. But mashallah, right now we are happy to hear that something is being done in order to make sure that that food is not actually wasted. I hope and I pray we in our own little ways do not waste food and drink. There are others across the globe who do not have food, drink or shelter or clothing. And yet we are wasteful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So this we learned from Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an. He was a man whom when he died, he was crying at his deathbed, at his own deathbed. People asked him, why are you crying? He says, on this day, I am remembering Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. When we were burying him, there was not enough to, to, to enshroud him with. Look at what I have. And he, he was crying to say, I have actually built a house here. I can't believe I've spent money in this world. That's what he used to say. And he said, I have 80,000 silver coins that are in this place. Anyone who needs them, please take them. And he says, I, be, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bear witness that I've never ever refused anyone who's come to ask me. Even if he's asked me and I felt in my heart, this man needs or he does not need. I made sure I gave him something. May Allah accept it from me, he says. And he says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me forgiveness wherever I have wasted wealth. Yet he was a person who did not waste. This was Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an. He was the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses regarding three of the companions more so of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst others who were slaves before and they were freed in Islam. Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu an. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an, Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, the kuffar of Quraysh and the leaders used to say, this man, we don't mind accepting your message, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, on condition that you chase away those who used to be our slaves. We are embarrassed to sit with them. So Allah revealed verses, وَلَا تَطُرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ ما عليك من حسابهم من شيء وما من حسابك عليهم من شيء فتطردهم فتطردهم فتكون من الظالمين وكذلك فتنا بعضهم. So many verses thereafter until Allah says وإذا جاءك الذين يؤمنون بآياتنا فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Allah says, do not chase away those who are calling out to Allah by day and by night, referring to these poor people. Allah says, their account is not on you and your account is not on them. 
Allah is speaking very highly of these poor people telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't chase them away. And Allah says, when they come to you, these people who believe, greet them with assalamu alaykum, clearly, subhanallah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to give a lot of importance to Bilal ibn Rabah, Suhaib al-Rumi, Khabbab ibn al-Arat and the others, whom Quraysh used to consider downtrodden. And this is when Quraysh understood that with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Islam, no difference between black and red and white, no difference between the rich and the poor. Everyone will sit together and everyone has exactly the same access to their maker, male, female and all the others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, protect us from racism and from this feeling of inferiority, which will actually result in our downfall. So we have a lot to learn from Khabbab ibn al-Arat. He passed away 37 Hijri in Kufa at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and he is buried there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. The next hero we are going to speak about, the best of all the warriors ever that the Muslims had, the name of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. He was known as Abu Sulaiman, the father of Sulaiman. Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al mughira His father was al-Walid ibn al mughira al-Makhzumi. He had a son known as Khalid. He had another known as al-Walid. He had another known as Umara. And he had another known as Hisham. All of these were children of al-Walid. Al-Walid was a very rich man, the father of Khalid. Very, very wealthy. And he was a person who used to donate the covering of the Kaaba one year and the whole of Quraysh used to gather to make it the following year. Every year they used to change the cover of the Kaaba. One year Al-Walid used to give it and the other year the whole of Quraysh together used to give it. That's how wealthy he was. And he was known as one of the leaders of Banu Makhzum, the Makhzumi clan. He was one of the leaders. So his sons grew up very wealthy and Khalid was a big man, powerful, muscular person. He was quite fair in complexion and he was very close in looks to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. And as a youngster, he was approximately 20 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because he felt that this man is competing with my father. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to talk to him, he used to say, I am more befitting to have been a prophet than you. Who are you and why did Allah reveal to you? You are an orphan. You're a person who has nothing. I am one whom Allah gave so much. I am supposed to have been the prophet. So Allah revealed verses. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ أَهُمْ يَقْسِمُونَ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّكَ نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ Allahu Akbar Allah speaks about what Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira and the others were saying that why did Allah not send down prophethood to a powerful man from Mecca or from Ta'if? Why did he have to send prophethood to this man in particular who was an orphan from amongst us? Allah answers them and says, are you the ones who are in charge of distributing the, the gifts of Allah? Are you the ones who are in charge of distributing the mercy of Allah? Allah says, we are responsible to give whomsoever we wish. And we have raised some above the others in virtue and in goodness and in wealth and in everything else in this world for many reasons in order to be a test for you. May Allah bless us all. So this was a response, but it's a lesson for us. We become jealous when someone does well, well in business. That is competing with Allah. Allah replies you here. And he says, why are you jealous? Are you the one who gave or did I give? When someone is knowledgeable and they're doing a lot of good work, we become jealous. If that is the jealousy we have, Allah says, you want to be in his shoes. Well, you need to understand we blessed him. That's exactly what happened with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira lost because he wanted to compete with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when someone has wealth, when they have children, when they have goodness, my brothers and sisters do not become jealous like the kuffar of Quraysh. Do not become jealous like those who want to compete with the gift of Allah because it is Allah's decision to give whom he wants, what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. It's not our decision. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was very angry. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, he looked at his father and he always used to say, I will never adopt what Muhammad has brought because he is competing with my father. He looked at it as competition. Right and wrong has nothing to do with competition. 
even if your enemy tells you something that is right. As a Muslim, you adopt it because it is right. And even if your friend tells you something that is wrong, as a Muslim, you reject it because it is wrong. Whether he's your friend or your enemy is something which is completely separate. But what is right and wrong is primary. May Allah bless us and grant us ease. So Khalid ibn Walid was brought up in a powerful home, a strong man. He was very brave. And he was a person who was tall, well known in Quraysh as a warrior from a very early age. Now Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us from that type of attitude that he had. He had a son. This son's name was Al-Walid ibn al-Walid, another one. In the battle of Badr, Al-Walid ibn al-Walid was taken captive by the Muslims and they called for a ransom to free him. And they asked for 4,000 dirhams, which was not much actually, which, but it was a lot in terms of to free a captive. And they said, Al-Walid, this man's father has a lot of money and he has caused a lot of harm against the Muslims. So Khalid ibn al-Walid and Hisham ibn al-Walid, they came to the, where the Muslims were in order to free their brother. And they had paid the ransom and they took their brother away. When they took their brother away, he went to Mecca and after a while, he announced he was a Muslim, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. So he was in captivity. He saw the Muslims pray. He saw how they operated, how they respected one another. He saw the beauty in that faith whilst he was captive and he loved it so much. So they asked him, why didn't you accept Islam whilst you were a captive? So Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid says, how could I accept Islam when I was a captive? People might think that my intentions were wrong and I just wanted to be freed. So I waited until my father paid the ransom and I left. Now I'm accepting it as a free man because I want to tell you it is definitely the truth. And he went back to Medina Munawwara and he became one of those who was very close to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one day Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously spoke to him and we will get to that. What did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid regarding his brother Khalid ibn al-Walid. This was the, after the battle of Badr, what had happened. At Uhud, Khalid ibn al-Walid had come and do you know he was on the side of the kuffar, of the enemy, of, the, of Quraysh, those who had usurped the wealth of the Muslimin. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, at that time he was not a Muslim. He looked at the archers and he saw that these people have left their positions. So immediately he took a group of men and he went back and swiped the Muslimin by sandwiching them between the enemy. And this is when the Muslims suffered a great loss at the hands of Khalid ibn al-Walid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all and may Allah grant us a lesson. Because the people had not obeyed the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Khalid ibn al-Walid was known as the hero of Uhud from the, from the Qurayshi or from the Qurashi perspective. From the perspective of the Kuffar of Mecca. Now, after that, Khalid ibn al-Walid came for the battle of the trench. You know, the battle of the trench that took place a year and a half later. What he did is he was responsible for executing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He was given the task. You need to watch for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and get rid of him. So as he went, he tried here and there, but you know, there was a trench that was dug and he just could not get to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is reported that as he tried to get there by night, Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu an had immediately noticed and alerted everyone and the plan was foiled. So Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu went back to Mecca with those who had lost in the battle. It didn't really take place because obviously the wind had come and I'm sure we would know the battle of the trench, the kuffar was sent back to Mecca miraculously by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu at the time of Hudaybiyah, when the Muslimin had come out without any weapons in order to make Umrah, the pilgrimage in Mecca, the kuffar of Mecca stopped them. They had sent Khalid ibn al-Walid with 200 men to go and attack the Muslims. But when he went, he saw that they were praying. They were praying. And he thought to himself, okay, I've got 200 men. Whilst these people go to their prostration, I will swipe at them. But he was shocked that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said Allahu Akbar and everyone went to sujood, half of them went to sajda and the other half stayed up. And then when he said Allahu Akbar, half of them came up and half of them went down. And he was saying, what is this all about? That was Salatul Khawf, specific Salah prescribed at, at a time of war. When Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given this gift because Allah says, 
that these people had intended for you to all be in prostration at once so they could swipe at you. So some of you go down and some of you stay up. When some come up, some will go down and so on. It's a beautiful salah and it was a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the time Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu in his heart, the first light had entered. He says, Ar-rajulu mamnu'ah. That means this man Muhammad, we will never be able to harm him. Impossible. I am a man, I have mastered the military arts completely. I cannot even get close to him for some reason. And so in his heart, he said, this man is going to lead and he's going to be the winner and he's going to be victorious. This is what Khalid tells us later, radiallahu an. So after Hudaybiya, he went back and he received a letter from his brother, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. And the letter said, Oh, my beloved brother Khalid, I always know you to be a very intelligent person. And as intelligent as you are, it cannot escape you that Islam is correct. With that mind of yours, you are such a powerful person in intellect. The Prophet has been asking about you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told me, Where is Khalid? Where is Khalid? And I told him, Inshallah, Allah will bring him along. He says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, a man like Khalid who is so intelligent, anyone who is absolutely intelligent will know that Islam is correct. If they are unbiased, they will know that what the Muslims are calling to and what they are worshipping is actually correct. They are calling towards worshipping one maker, the maker alone and doing good all your life. And this is what is correct. So Khalid ibn al-Walid read the letter and he was touched by it. Because now one thing had happened at Hudaybiyah and after Hudaybiyah, this was the second thing. The third thing, he slept that night and he saw a dream. The dream of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he says, I saw myself on a piece of land that was dry and very, very narrow. And then I saw that I was traveling to another beautiful green piece of land, which was very broad. And he said, when I got up, I knew it means go to Medina Munawwara and that is Islam and Allah has chosen Islam for you. So he decided to speak to his friends. Who were his friends? Now it was quite tricky to talk to them because they all hated Islam. The first one, he had a friend and this friend was quite close to him, Safwan ibn Umayyah. He tells Safwan, oh Safwan, what do you think of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I've tried so much, the man, you cannot get close to him. I believe he's going to win one day and he's going to overtake everyone, the Arabs and the non-Arabs. And I think it's about time we went. So Safwan says, no ways, never. Are you crazy? What are you talking about? That is because Safwan ibn Umayyah had lost his father and brother. And so he decided, okay, he told Safwan, okay, forget what I said. It's okay, just forget about it. And he went to Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, and told him exactly the same thing. And Ikrimah responded in the same way, the son of Abu Jahl. He says, no ways, are you crazy? He says, okay, forget about it. Then he went to a third friend of his by the name of Uthman ibn Abi Talha. Uthman ibn Abi Talha, there are two or three different names. Perhaps they are referring to the same person or one may be referring to the nephew and one may be referring to the uncle. Because Uthman ibn Talha is one man and Uthman ibn Talha ibn Abi Talha may be the same man or may be the nephew. But whoever it was, this was Uthman ibn Talha, a friend of Khalid ibn al-Walid. So when Khalid told him, ibn al-Walid, that let's do this, let's go to Medina, I'm really feeling to go because of these reasons. He said, okay, I'm coming with you, let's go. Subhanallah, amazing. So quietly, the two of them prepared everything and they decided to do hijrah without anyone knowing. They went and on the way, as they are going, they saw one of the powerful men of Quraysh by the name of Amr ibn al-As, the man who later conquered Egypt. Amr ibn al-As, he was one of those who went to Najashi, if you recall, on behalf of Quraysh. And he was speaking about Jafar ibn Abi Talib. That was a man, inshallah, we'll talk about him in a few days time. But Khalid ibn al-Walid and this man, Uthman ibn Talha, they met him and they asked him, Oh Amr, where are you going? Or oh, he asked them, where are you guys going? So they said, no, we want to know from you. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was brave enough. He said, you know what? We are going to accept Islam and we're going to Medina. He said, guess what? I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Subhanallah. They arrived in Al-Madin Al-Munawwara. The leaders of Quraysh, their children now are here. And they came and as they were entering Medina, 
Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid sees his brother and rushes to him. He says, Wallahi, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam already informed us that you are on your way. Imagine a miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Already informed his companions that Khalid ibn Al-Walid is on his way to come here. Subhanallah. He says, Amazingly, let's go. The messenger is waiting for you, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the three of them walk into the presence of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the greeting itself spoke a mountain. He says, "Assalamu alaika ya Rasulullah." May peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. This was Khalid ibn al-Walid, the man whom they all wanted to kill in Uhud because of how many Muslims he killed, and yet Khalid ibn al-Walid greets him as Rasulullah and Amr ibn al-As. And Uthman ibn Talha and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Look, this is Quraysh. It has brought to you its liver, meaning it has now thrown out to you the most important part of its organs." Amazing. And so Khalid ibn Al Walid says, "I declared the shahada in front of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but there was a problem that I had in my heart. What was it? I felt that I killed so many Muslims, and now look at what's going on." I caused so much harm against Islam. So he said, I looked at Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I said, Oh messenger, please pray for me. I have caused so much harm against the Muslimin. What will happen to me? May Allah forgive me. That is when Muhammad says, Ya Khalid, inna al-Islam ma yajubbu ma qabla. Oh Khalid, I want to inform you that Islam deletes the sins that were committed prior to it. So it doesn't delete all your deeds. It only deletes your sins. Remember this. You don't start with a new leaf. You start with a leaf that only has good on it. Amazing. If you did good before you accepted Islam, it will come through even after you accepted Islam. But if you have done bad, that is what is wiped out. Just like my brothers and sisters, Tauba does exactly the same thing. It wipes out the bad and it leaves the good. May Allah grant us repentance because repentance does exactly the same thing. Tauba, the meaning of which is repentance and turning to Allah. So this was Khalid ibn Al Walid. He heard the statement once; it was not enough. He heard it twice; it was not enough. He heard it a third time. Then he says, "Oh messenger, I pledge my allegiance to you. There it is. Here you are. I am Khalid ibn Al Walid, and I've come to you. Here we are. Subhanallah." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a dua for him. He says, "Oh messenger, for every harm that I've caused Islam, pray for me." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Oh Allah, forgive Khalid for everything that he has done against Islam." Subhanallah. This was the acceptance of Islam of Khalid ibn Al Walid radhiyallahu an. He took part in the Battle of Mu'ta immediately after that. And remember, we spoke about how there were three leaders appointed by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam: Zayd ibn Haritha, Jafar ibn Abi Talib. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiyallahu anhum and Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they will lead one after the other. All three of them lost their lives. Then Thabit ibn Arqam went and took the flag, the flag of leadership, and he gave it to Khalid ibn Walid. And Khalid ibn Walid was a new Muslim, and he said, "No ways, I am not going to take this. You have." Actually, taken part in Badr, O Thabit ibn Arqam. I am not from amongst those. You'd rather carry it. So Thabit ibn Arqam looks at the rest of the companions on that day of Mu'ta, and he says, "Do you agree that Khalid is the warrior from amongst us who knows best how to tackle the enemy, and he shall lead us?" And they all agreed. So that is when Khalid took it, and the battle changed its course, and they came back to Medina. Subhanallah, having achieved quite a bit in Mu'ta, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant them all goodness and grant us too a lot of goodness. So this was the man, Khalid ibn Al Walid. Every single army he was in, he won his battle, without exception. Subhanallah. So much so that today, the military schools of the West. They study the life of Khalid ibn Al Walid. There are so many movies that you will find that are after Khalid ibn Al Walid, radiyallahu anhu, and his life that are studied very carefully by military schools of the non-Muslims and the Muslims across the globe. He was an intelligent man, extremely intelligent. Khalid ibn Al Walid, radiyallahu an. So at the time of the victory of Makkah. He was the only man who was the newest in accepting Islam, who was put as one of the leaders of the army of the Muslimin, because Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was there himself. Abu Ubaid Amir ibn al-Jarrah was put in the front, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam was to the right side, and guess who was on the left? Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, a child of Quraysh who had just come. He was going back to Quraysh as victorious, and he had told those youngsters already that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is going to win. He's going to overtake, and he's going to rule everywhere here. He used to tell them at that stage that you know what? 
it is an honor for us to accept Muhammad. He's a part of Quraysh. Why are we jealous of him? He's one of us. What a powerful statement. I think we can learn from that. Sometimes we harass the children of our own community, not realizing that if they are a part of our community, by us harassing them, we are actually doing our own community a disservice. Rather, we are proud of the achievements of our country, our community and the ummah at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand what was the statement of Khalid ibn al-Walid. Anyway, he took part in so many battles that people began to say, Khalid is the warrior, Khalid is the man. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu came in and said, I don't like the way people are now thinking that Khalid is the big magician who wins all the wars. So, O oh Abu Ubaidah, I write, he wrote him a letter and said, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah, go and tell Khalid that he must come back to Medina, no more taking part in the war as a leader. He's just a normal Muslim and you go and overtake. So Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah, if you recall a few days ago, we said he took the letter to Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, and he gave the letter after the war was over. Khalid ibn al-Walid immediately said, no problem, I'm going back to Medina Munawwara. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I did not remove Khalid because I had a problem with him, but I removed it him because people started believing that it is him and we believe it is Allah. So this is why there were others who were placed in the place of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu at one stage. And this is Khalid ibn al-Walid on his deathbed four years later, just four years after Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had removed him, he was on his deathbed. And he says, Wallahi, there is not a single spot on my body, not a single spot on my body that does not have some form of wound on it. My entire body has wounds all over my face, my head and my entire body. And yet I am dying on a bed and not on the battlefield. So those who are cowards must learn a lesson from me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he has written death for you, you will die no matter where it is. I took part in so many of the battles, but Allah decided you will die in the way that the camel dies. These are his words. Then he says, Subhanallah, Khalid ibn al-Walid was known as Saifullah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sitting in Medina during the battle of Mu'tah, we made mention of it the other day when we said that he's, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the knowledge of the unseen on that day to be able to see that the Khalid ibn al-Walid has now taken over the leadership of the army in Mu'tah. And he says, Akhadahu Saifun min suyufillahi azza wa jal. He says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, a sword from amongst the swords of Allah has taken over the reins of the Muslims. So imagine if Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was killed in the battlefield, people would say the sword of Allah is broken. So Allah's choice was that he must not be killed in the battlefield. He was on his bed. He died a natural, normal death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. This was Khalid ibn al-Walid. He passed away in Hims and he is buried in Hims, which is in Syria. May Allah grant us peace in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in all the countries, in Gaza and in everywhere else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us peace and goodness. My brothers and sisters, I end with something important. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu on his deathbed made the most famous statement that we know about him. He says, شَغَلَنِ الْجِهَادُ عَن تَعَلُّمِ كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْقُرْآنِ he says, I was busy in the battlefield. I was unable to learn much about the Quran, subhanallah. But I have no regrets. Allah has chosen me to fulfill a part of Islam. I have to stop there. It is the most important lesson we learn. Not every one of us will be masters in the Quran. Not every one of us will be professionals in Islamic knowledge. We have from amongst us doctors, accountants. We have men of different disciplines and women whom we need in our society and, the co and community. We do not underestimate the value of one another. We should never think I'm the only Muslim who's serving Islam. No matter who you are and what you have, you may serve Islam either through your profession, through your wealth, through your knowledge, or through a combination of more than one of those things. Do not ever think that the work you are doing is the only work of Allah or his messenger, because that would be an insult to Allah, having brought down the spectrum of Islam to one job that you are doing. No ways. There are 100,000 ways you can serve Islam. If you think there's only one way, you have insulted the other 99.999,000 
different ways of supporting Islam. May Allah grant us ease and help us to love one another, to understand how much we need one another. Brothers and sisters, this love that we should be feeling for one another is such that really we should have a smile on our faces when we see each other. May Allah grant us unity and goodness. May He help us develop our hearts and feelings towards one another. May He help us appreciate the different works of the different people who are serving Islam in totally different ways. And may we be never be people who think that we are the only ones who are serving Islam. May Allah safeguard all of us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha. Thank you.